I was born in a small city called Siegen. And as you can see on this historical picture, uh, it's very hard to miss the church when you enter the city. So cities are shaped by religions architecturally for centuries, and cities are also shaped by religions socially. Because churches are not only buildings made of concrete. Churches are also places where people meet each other and where they do things together. And what is true for my native town, far west in Germany, is also true for Berlin, the so-called capital of atheism. Here you see the uh, Berlin Cathedral in the city center right next to its much more famous neighbor, the TV Tower. But this is also true for a um, global metropolis like London. This picture shows the uh, St. Paul's Cathedral and the financial hub of Europe. So, I'm an urban geographer, and I would like to show you why religion is important in the European city today. And I would like to do so because uh, sociologists claim for a long time, for about the past 150 years, that the more urban a society gets, the more secular it becomes. Thus, they claim that cities are getting less and less religious. Religions are less and less important in cities. And I would like to contradict this equation. I would like to challenge this equation by making two points. Firstly, the immigration of people into cities lead to a uh, pluralization of religions. And secondly, it's the revitalization of Christianity in European cities in new spaces. So without people moving into one place and settling down, cities will not exist. So, Immigration to cities is a crucial part of the definition of a city. Uh, immigration to Germany is mainly shaped by the incoming of guest workers during the 1960s and 70s. And they were called guests because they were supposed to leave the country after they contributed to the economic success of Germany. But they didn't do as the German state expected them to do. So instead of this, they stayed, they settled down mainly in cities. As of today, there are about 10% of the building population with a Turkish background. This is approximately 300,000 people. And a crucial part of this 300,000 people identifies themselves as Muslims. So Muslim communities are an um, important part of the Berlin society. But the crucial question is whether they also belong to everyday public life in a city. For a very long time, we were quite used to these pictures. Whenever Islam was present in the public, it provoked protest. And why did it provoke protest? The main reason for that was not that um, Germany is a secular country where religions don't belong to the public sphere, but the main argument was, and here I would like to draw your attention to the cross in the background of the picture, was that Germany has a Christian heritage. So it's only since the past, let's say, five to ten years that we're also used to these pictures, that we're also used that, to the fact that um, mosques are also shaping urban neighborhoods, just as churches did for centuries. But let's have a look um, at the most diverse city in Europe. Let's have a look across the channel and see how immigration into the UK shaped the city of London. This is a very ordinary looking building on Brick Lane in East London. But beside its unspectacular facade, this building has a very interesting story to tell. Because it housed three religions at some point in history. It was firstly built in the 1740s as a church for the French Huguenots fleeing persecution. And it turned into a synagogue 100 years later because Jews from Central Europe and Russia were populating the area. And today, this building is a mosque. Because after the uh, former colonies of the Commonwealth gained independence, more and more people moved into the neighborhood and claimed their spaces to pray. So this building is a symbol. It is a symbol for how architecture is a way for cities to learn to deal with their religious diversity. 
Compared to Berlin, London seems to be much more competent in dealing uh, with, one, with many religions in one space. But there's no need to be too much worried about Berlin, because Berlin is catching up. The picture you can see here is an architectural plan uh, of a building that is going to be constructed, uh, hopefully in the next years, if they uh, manage to raise the money for that. Um, and this building will contain praying rooms for Muslims, Christians, and Jews within one building. And I think it's a very impressive effort. Um, and I'm very curious about the fact how, how this building, if it's going to be built, it's not sure yet, how it will shape the religious environment of Berlin. But I'm also very skeptical, to be honest, because this building looks like a church to me and it would cost bucket loads of money to build it. And this leads me to my second point. What is going on with Christianity in our cities? You might be aware of the fact that um, during the past 20 to 30 years, the traditional churches, the national churches, are constantly losing their members. The reason for that is not that people stop believing. The main reason why the traditional churches are losing their members is because they get, they, uh, get less and less attractive, especially for young people. A pastor I interviewed recently got to the very heart of the problem. He claimed that the churches do have a need to postmodernize themselves if they want to survive. So while the church is thinking about how they could do that, how they could postmodernize themselves, they thinking about that for like 20 or 30 years or so, um, some people are doing it. And the in interesting question for a researcher is where can we find these people in the city? And interestingly, we can find them where the cool places are. So hipsters are setting the pace. Uh, we find them in, the, in these neighborhoods where the lines of gentrification cross. Vice Magazine recently reported uh, um, about uh, hips, how hipster Christians are saving Dawson. Dawson is again a neighborhood in, uh, in the east of London. And they're reporting about a young crew praying in the attic of an abandoned church. And this young group is not alone. They belong to a white network. It's the city, it's the Redeemer City to City network. And this network aims to plant churches in urban neighborhoods. They don't build churches, they plant churches in urban neighborhoods. So, uh, they do so very successfully in London, and they do so very successfully in the city of Berlin. You might know this building. This is the Babylon. It's built in the 1920s. And imagine it's Saturday evening. You go into the cinema, you buy your ticket, you buy a cold drink, and you're going to sit down in a very comfortable cinema seat. It might be much more comfortable than the one you're sitting on right now. And you're watching Batman flying through Gotham City and you had a very hot day at work, or you listen to lots of talks, um, and you sit down and you fall asleep. And if you wake up the next morning, you're going to hear more than 400 people praying and singing in the same room, because then you're part of the Berlin Project. The Berlin Project is uh, the name of a church. It's a newly established church a couple of years ago by two young pastors in their late 20s. And this church, this new, newly established church, is very attractive, uh, especially for the creative class, because they don't offer their servers in a purpose-built church, but in everyday spaces, like a cinema. They also offer, space in, uh, offer their servers in a um, uh, co-working space. So these two examples, um, the young crew praying in the attic of an abandoned church in Dawson, in East London, and the Berlin Project, praying in a cinema, shows that Christianity is not falling asleep, although the traditional churches are losing their members. But it shows that Christianity is revitalized in cities in new spaces. So I started with this equation. I said that the uh, sociologists claim for a long time that the more urban a society gets, the less religious it becomes. And I offered you two processes to prove the contrary. First, the immigration of people into cities leads to a pluralization of religions. Secondly, the revitalization of religions, of Christianity, in new urban forms. And both processes together um, makes religions in the city more visible. 
So there are two stories to tell. The urban is not only a um, secular environment where religions are disappearing. The urban is also a place where religions are increasingly dynamic. And both processes together makes, uh, results in new architectural forms and in new cultural forms. So the urban is neither entirely secular nor entirely religious. The urban is a post-secular space. And that's why I would like to call the city 2.0 a post-secular city. Thank you.